Welcome, everyone. Um, this uh, we'll just kind of just get this to the first slide um, here at demystifying the content gap between TikTok creators and film TV creators. We're very glad that you could join us today. And we know many of you are staying up late or waking up early to watch us from other countries. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, what we want to start off with is a backdrop in how this panel topic came into being. Um, then we'll do some introductions to the business of creating, the Writers Guild Foundation, Bloom XO, and then the panelists before going into discussions. But you know, feel free when we get into the um, into the discussions, feel free to ask questions throughout in the Q and A. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, since we are talking about TikTok, you know, please go on TikTok and sign up, plan it, watch it, post to it. You know, because it's what all is about. Um, not not the second, but you know, hopefully at the end. Um, for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, but, you know, part of this came up to be is because, you know, we look at, you know, like the kind of the question came out was, can TikTok be a pathway for development and creative expression, you know, for either TikTok creators wanting to create for TV and film or for Hollywood traditionalists to create and test content on TikTok, you know, and to set the stage to help with these discussion topics, you know, the next few slides are some items in the news to kind of give some context behind the panel, you know, for those more of like as a primer of like where things are, you know, and so what we wanted to start off with is what you see on your screen here is more of an infographic on the left hand side, you know, that shows the overall social media landscape um, that actually was just done a few days ago and posted on um, Visual Capitalist. Um, and you can see like how huge the growth and the places of where content is created and consumed. You know, and what you'll see very often on the left hand side is the most recent social media review with the biggest players like Meta, which for those not familiar with, it was formerly known as Facebook and they own in that big blue ball, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger and have 7.5 billion combined users. Now TikTok owned by ByteDance is in the red ball in the upper right that you see there in the kind of middle upper right, you know, with a combined user base of over a billion users. I mean, so it's, these are just huge, huge, huge um, platforms with users and where a lot of content is being used and consumed, you know, and this is this entire ecosystem. And obviously there's a lot of players that you see, you know, swirling around it, you know, and then the question kind of comes down to is that, can it converge with traditional ways of viewing content? Like you see in the upper right hand corner with films. You know, or even on TV or, you know, now it's laptops and iPads, you know, and how do you bridge that content gap, you know, between the two worlds. And very often, like the way I've kind of like viewed it as is for those, I don't know who's fans of Stranger Things, you know, but, you know, I kind of liken it to the TV show Stranger Things for those who have watched it, you know, remember how they lived in one world and then there was also the upside down. And the upside down is like an alternate dimension existing in a parallel to the human world, you know, and they kind of go to go back and forth and what, you know, what is that back and forth, you know, what is that content between TikTok creators and social media worlds versus the traditional cinema and TV, you know, is there a lot of overlap and, you know, can there be and, and that's what we hope to discuss. As we're seeing what's happened in the news, like the, here's a Wall Street Journal article. This is a screenshot from it where it says Hollywood embraces TikTok stars for TV film projects. So you see a lot, you know, particularly these ginormous billions of users on TikTok and content created where, where you have, um, you know, they're creating content and stars. So you'll see studio executives increasingly hiring talent made famous on digital platforms. You know, it's like Charlie D'Amelio and Addison Ray are two of the most followed creators on TikTok. You know, and they're being profiled in film and TV projects. You know, for example, Netflix paid more than 20 million for the rights to He's All That, which is a romantic comedy starring 20 year old Ms. Ray. And she has more than 84 million followers, the third highest among all users. If you look at this, this recent article as well, um, here you have Hollywood and TikTok, eight TikTokers were seen in Hollywood blockbusters. Um, to quote from even the last article, they said, traditional Hollywood is really in a weird spot right now because they're seeing TikTokers and YouTubers you know, becoming more popular than traditional actors and actresses. Whether you agree with that or not, we can debate that. Um, and that is why you see Hollywood trying to figure out how to tap into influencers and be in the traditional film and TV space. You know, and it's interesting to see there is this crossover with acting talent side, you know, from TikTok to film and TV, you know, and one of the things, you know, that kind of came up for me, like was wondering, okay, fine, you see all these examples of talents, like an acting talent, but you know, what about writers? What about producers? You know, how, how can you get involved on both sides there? You know, the ones that get the most 
you know, um, press media is acting, but there's this entire ecosystem within Hollywood that's involved. Um, and by the way, there's also um, another article worth checking out about traditional industries embracing social media. Um, my friend Joe Epstein, who hopefully is on watching this panel, so Joe, if you're here, say hello. Um, you told me about this Vanity Fair article titled Twitter Teaches CEOs, CEOs, How to Make Friends and Influence People. So you have traditional companies like execs using Twitter to create content and share info from that example. So now you have like Twitter stars, you know, going more traditional ways, but then you also have traditional contents and acting like Brendan Fraser, um, you know, who isn't on TikTok, but he was made famous on it recently by people posting about him. Um, Brendan Fraser has become a TikTok obsession, despite the fact that he's been largely absent from the public eye for over a decade. And if you hashtag Brendan Fraser on TikTok, you'll see they've racked up 166 million views with video content from creators like thirsting over old clips of George of the Jungle and praising him for his humble nature and, and his vulnerability in interview segments. Um, another example of what you see here is um, BBC Nativity. Um, what they ended up doing is um, in 20, 2009, there was this um, movie called Nativity um, posted of BBC, and um, it's now become like a staple of watching stuff online. And I mean, so watching holiday content, you know, around the holidays. And this is from 2009, and you see a lot of the kid actings in the bottom left-hand corner. They have also now become, here they were actors and now on TikTok and having quite a few um, followers and actually creating content on TikTok a bit there. So it's definitely something worth um, checking out if you're not familiar with Nativity. Um, obviously, there's like the big name actors like Will Smith and Jennifer Lopez and Fallon and Reese who are on TikTok now and creating content and worth following, but you see more of that, that traditional side as well. So that's just more to give you the context of like what this panel was about, right? Like it is about what the discussion will be, but we wanted to kind of give some context between social and tradition, social media, how the world works um, on that side, but then also um, understanding also that more of the traditional side with film and TV. But before we dive into the introductions, we wanted to remind everyone here that, you know, this, this is a forum for everyone here, you know, so we encourage you to introduce yourself, your name, where you're from, and what you do in the chat section. You know, normally when Jennifer and I actually host these, and when we have done this before COVID and in person, you know, we'd always say, turn to the person to your right, turn to the person to your left, introduce yourselves, because we're all here to help each other out. And these might be the people that help you in your careers, and maybe something you could help them. In a virtual world, it's a little bit more difficult. You know, you don't have the, you know, you don't have like name tags on you. So the chat is where hopefully you can introduce yourselves and get to know one another while we're having this um, panel discussion. And again, it's about making our creative industry stronger. It's really the people here. It's a, you know, it is a collaborative process and a relationship business. The one thing is that if you do have questions for the panelists, go in the Q&A section. You'll see again on the bottom, there's a thing that says Q&A and there's separate for chat. So those are kind of like two different worlds, kind of the upside down world and not the, you know, change your things, right? But the Q&A is where you'll um, ask the questions. Um, okay, so we'll just talk a little bit about business of creating. We'll go into then um, Writers Guild and then Bloom. Um, business of creating was co-founded by my dear friend, Jennifer Mangan, who you see here, and you'll get to know a little bit shortly more, and I'll do a proper introduction on Jen. But we really started this and all began organically, really just trying to help out the creative community and getting projects seen and heard, you know, and what we've seen over the years is that these panels have been really changed and, and diverse from the different types of topics, but it, it's, for it's crossing film and TV and digital. It's getting everything from how to pitch onto film festivals to unit photography, to financing production, you know, but it really is based upon what you, um, the audience really have asked us to kind of see and want to hear about. And so we're really always open to ideas. And so if you have suggestions, we're always open to it. Just reach out to Jennifer and me on that and we're just um just always very honored that people join these calls and you know take part in these um and just to learn more about you know the creative industry and and making us all like a stronger industry together um so what i'd like to do next is um turn it over to enid from the writers guild foundation who we're very very thankful for for always hosting hosting these events with us and these virtual events and just wanted to kind of pass it over to her for a few words about the writers guild who was who was amazing uh, thanks michael oh. hi everybody 
<laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. If you're new to the Writers Guild Foundation, we are a nonprofit organization based in LA. And as the slide says, our mission is to preserve and promote the craft and history and voices of screen storytelling. We host events such as this regularly. We'll, we'll have a couple of fun ones um, at the top of 2022. So definitely uh, check our website, wgfoundation.org, or follow us on social media to get updates on that. We also operate the library, which is still closed, but we are doing, we are hosting virtual library office hours, I guess. Um, and that's two days a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, information on our website as well. Um, enjoy, thanks for, thanks for our partnership. Yes, no, I love it. And if, when, when the library does open up, I really encourage people to be able to see it because it's really incredible that the scripts that they have are just phenomenal on the TV and film side. It's, it's a really incredible resource. And it, it's also a really beautiful library too and very cozy. So when it does open up, you know, please go visit. Um, so then what we'd like to talk about next is I'd like to um, pass it on to Ariel. Ariel, do you want to talk about Bloom XL? Of course, absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here on behalf of Bloom and to be a part of this business of creating and Writers Guild Foundation event. So thank you for having me. Um, to give you a little bit more background about our company, we focus on several elements within the media and entertainment industry as an agency and magazine. So we have headquarters in LA and New York, and we have a variety of teams from events, influencer marketing, research, creative strategy, and then obviously editorial with the magazine and more. So one thing that is going to be kind of a repeating theme for at least our company and within the influencer space is we really try to focus on bringing more dimension to influencer marketing. So, you know, on the content creator side, we've been working with influencers, creators for several years now. And one of the things that we really believe in and understand is trying to find that authentic voice. What does that mean? You know, our, our company is all about uniting authentic storytellers. So in, in the sense of really bringing meaning to that, it means having a unique story to share, to, to document. And that takes place in many shapes and forms. So we make sure the creators we work with are passionate about the projects they work in and the content that they create, but also seeing how that's evolved is something we'll, we'll discuss a little bit later. So we do have an agency and a magazine. Um, we, we work with many studios on film projects as well. So over there, you can see we had a cover for the French Dispatch and had an exclusive look into the film. Um, we also have a lot of creators that are part of it, including Josh as well. And uh, over there, you can see it, Chris Hahn, who's a creator we've worked with for several years now. And she's passionate about you know motherhood, but also fashion. And, there is so much of it is, is not black and white. It's not in one category or another, but there is this blend of, of unique personalities. Like we're dealing with human beings that are passionate and Josh will be able to definitely give you more insight into that throughout this panel because he's gone through it for years to, you know, you evolve as a person too, as a creator. And so taking your audience on that journey has been a huge part of what we do at Bloom. And yeah, I mean, we'll discuss a little bit more throughout the panel, but it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Awesome, thanks, Ariel. And what we'd like to do is begin here, but uh, let me do a first a proper introduction to Jennifer Mangan. Jennifer, you know, both, it's so funny because I was like, I was like, I was like, what's her title? I was like, it's friends. She's my friend, you know, so <laughs> I was the first one. But Jennifer is a, a writer producer who owns her own independent production company called Beautiful Day Productions, by the way, I love the name, um, which they focus on materials that uplifts and empowers women through comedy and sci-fi fantasy. Um, after graduating with distinction from UCLA Extension in Business and Management and Entertainment, which I think that's how we met actually, right? That one time, yep. Jennifer co-founded and produced the Women in Film Mini Upfronts, promoting female content creators via red carpet industry screenings of trailers and sizzles for unproduced projects. Um, recognizing the need for creatives to gain practical advice and guidance from seasoned entertainment execs in order to market and sell their projects, Jennifer co-founded and moderates the panel series Business of Creating, which we have here. Um, currently, Jennifer's sci-fi fantasy television show Animal Magnetism is in development with executive producer Randy Greenberg, who's awesome, who's known for the Meg franchise, A Tale Dark and Grim, and Cowboys and Aliens. And with that, I pass it over to my friend Jennifer. <laughs> 
thank you very much, everybody. I am so excited to be here and learn from everybody. So diving in, quick introductions. Ariel, here we are. Ariel Sarah R. is a seasoned media and marketing executive at Bloom XO with a wide array of experience in digital marketing, data analytics, publicity, and editorial work. She's passionate, as we saw, about highlighting stories and bringing people together to celebrate individuality through all the projects she works on. Additionally, Ariel Sarah is an alumna of the USC Marshall School of Business and Harvard University. So everybody welcome Ariel. And next up, we have Josh Sadowski, aka Mama Penny, one of my favorite characters. I have laughed so hard watching these sketches of his. Josh is a comedian, content creator, writer, singer, songwriter, and founder of the Halo House, plus more. Obviously multi-talented. Uh, he's passionate about creating characters such as Mama Penny, developing powerful stories, connecting with his audience, and making incredible impacts. His profile, Laugh with Josh, brings together the vibrancy of the characters he creates with the relevance of the surrounding world. And y'all, he's got over 4.6. I read that correctly. I had to double check. 4.6 million followers. I think I need to learn something from this man. All right. And finally, yeah. Oh, God, sorry. Yeah, round of applause. I'm so excited. I'm forgetting myself. Uh, and finally, my partner in crime is Michael Fisk. Yay, uh, Michael. Um, so Michael, of course, is the co-founder of Business of Creating with me. Good fortune is mine with that. He is also a senior marketing executive in the entertainment industry having spearheaded over 450 marketing campaigns for studios like Sony, Lionsgate, NBC Universal, Warner Brothers, and currently MGM. You may have heard of the whole Bond franchise. I don't know, but that's Michael, everybody. So Michael, uh, he also runs Intermark, the international consulting practice, focusing on helping filmmakers, producers, directors, and distributors with long-term marketing and strategy. His passion is making your passion project succeed. Fun fact, as we just kind of heard, because I, I blew the secret, his favorite marketing campaigns he's worked on are the last six James Bond movies for the James Bond franchise, La La Land, and most recently, House of Gucci and Licorice Pizza. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Michael and our entire team. Thank you, everybody. Okay, Michael. What, please, somebody help me. What is an influencer and how have they evolved and what exactly is short form content? Give me the short version. So tell me more, Ariel. Absolutely. So, you know, to discuss a little bit just about how content creators and from a marketing perspective have evolved, there are definitely more niches and actual types of content, you know? So a few years ago, you looked at Instagram, content creators, a lot of it, you know, was fashion and lifestyle. Now, you know, with TikTok, there's almost any, you know, several content categories are there. So if, if you're passionate about a very specific type of content, such as aviation or a specific type of comedy, it's no longer, you know, just comedy. There's so many subcategories. And that's really given the opportunity for the creators that we work with to create their own categories and create their own niches based on what they're passionate about and forming a community around that. So we've definitely been able to you know, focus on more of the qualitative factors as well. I think there's been more of, you know, the very beginning when influencers and everything was like very new, people were so focused on the numbers and it's really more about that. There's so much more that can be done and the true fit that comes from a brand marketing perspective is finding a voice that aligns authentically, organically. I mean, these are words that are, you know, seen throughout marketing so much, but what does that mean? So it's, it's finding that right fit. Um, and, and that's completely changed. So with TikTok, there's so much has changed and I, I'm passing it on to Josh, like, what would that mean for you in terms of how your role has changed as well? Yeah. I mean, I, first of all, I'm so glad I could be here with everyone and I'm excited to have an open discussion. Um, I started making content from home uh, three, four years ago. Uh, I lived in the middle of nowhere in Missouri and I was raised in a very musical family. My mom was an opera singer and I always wanted to be an actor growing up. I loved writing and social media was the only outlet I really had access to to express myself. And I was able to you know, develop comedy skits and characters. You know, It started out with just relatable content where I wouldn't even have any dialogue at all. And then, you know, over time, I was able to, you know, create these characters that were 
relatable to different audiences based on people I've interacted with, or even, you know, my own parents or my friends or my family. And, um, you know, that has been an amazing journey. I feel like I've developed my writing skills over the past couple of years. And obviously with growth and, you know, I started 18 and now I'm 21 going on 22. I've wanted to evolve as much as possible. And my passion, again, starting out was music and acting. So now that I'm in LA, uh, my focus is really developing my craft as much as possible and learning and educating myself as much as I can to develop that and and moving into music and moving into acting and, and mainly production. Because I also, I, I ran a management firm for two years and we managed 13 artists um, exclusively and non-exclusively. And I also started the production company and started Creator House. Kind of did a little bit of everything. And uh, it was definitely a lot, but I love doing it. Um, and, you know, it just, it takes time. And my thing is I've always wanted to reach families and I've wanted to bring people together and I've wanted to inspire other people to do the same. Um, and I've been able to do that through my content. And it's definitely been a journey. And I found a good balance in, in working with larger projects. Like I think having long-term goals and uh, developing that instead of staying, you know, being stuck in one small category um, and developing my skills, so. If I can hop in on that, um, I'm, I'm jumping to the next slide a little bit, even though we don't have it up, y'all. But so you were talking about how you're, you know, starting to develop these characters. Sorry, Michael, that wasn't me being subtle. That's not, no, no, I don't. that's not in me, you know. But so, Josh, I was wondering, you know, can you tell us a bit more about how you developed these characters and, you know, it, how you came about with some of these different things, because you were mentioning that, and I would love to know more, you know, is it the same as far as developing something for, uh, you know, something, a longer full length show, as opposed to something, you know, a short bite size type of thing. Yeah. And, you know, how much, how much, uh, you know, again, since I'm coming more from a traditional background, how does that compare when you're getting your locations, when you're figuring out the costumes and all that kind of stuff? What's, you know, Tell me more. What's yeah, the Venn yeah. diagram? Um, working from home when it comes to the costumes is definitely a little bit uh, harder. You know, you kind of have to improvise, you know, with the clothing you have or, you know, if you go online and buy a couple things. Um, and Which definitely... towel do you use? You know, do you go with the white? Nice one from Costco. It's a very nice towel. <laughs> I have Ooh. a specific <laughs> brand. It fits perfectly. It lays well. Um, definitely gone through different ones. Um, but, you know, I think like even with sets and different things like that, that was definitely a huge struggle for me because I loved I was very picky about my visuals also. Like I, instead of filming on my phone, I started filming on my DSLR. Like I invested in a nicer camera. I wanted to, you know, making those short videos, I was like, okay, awesome. I'm giving someone a good laugh, but where do I have this connection with my audience where I'm building a relationship between obviously myself and, and the person who's consuming my content, but also my characters. Like how do I make someone fall in love with some, like a character like you do in a, a traditional show. Like when you watch a show for so many seasons, everybody has their favorite character, their favorite actor. How do I do that with short form content? So I started to do longer, longer form being three to four minutes, right? Um, longer form being three to four minutes, um, but scripted comedy skits. And so I would have storylines and really try to tie in all the characters. So Mama Penny, um, I grew up in a household where it was, it was pretty, low income like you know we were always on the road my mom was in like ministry and she was a singer and my dad just did construction and so I experienced what it was like to and my mom she's Latin and she loved to like go use her coupons and everything and so I tried to just pull everything out of that that I could relate to that was either frustrating or I felt was funny and other people found you know humorous in my family and I would just tie that into my character so mom Penny became a character where she's like has this son and, you know, she's always on a budget and she's trying to live her life, um, you know, having an interesting, fun relationship with him. And Philip is a character where he claims he has a lot of money. He's kind of like that LA, you know, he's got all the money in the world, but he really doesn't have any, right? It's all show. And then Susie's kind of like that Karen, you know, that we always interact with. No, no shame to anyone who has a name Karen. Um, but she, and that's why I named her Susie. Um, and no shame to anyone with the name Susie. Um, but, you know, it was just kind of like building those characters. And it took time. I, I will say like with all the characters, it was, it started out where the voices were different, the constant reoccurring jokes, the personality was different for each character. And, um, 
you know, it's almost like having a baby and, and watching it grow um, and seeing that personality like flourish. And it's been exciting because when I write, I'm able to kind of get in that mindset of, okay, I'm writing for this character. What would this character do when they're put in this situation? And um, I just started writing and, and expressing all of that. And, and it's been fun. And um, that's kind of how I developed those characters. Great, because they do seem very three-dimensional. They're very separate from each other, which is really enjoyable to check. Because again, it's such a short in and out that you're like, oh, okay, wait, there was a lot more three-dimensionality than you might expect from something that short. So I found that quite interesting, again, coming from a more traditional uh, you know, outlet as yeah. opposed to the, you know, the, the mini bites. And just to add to that, you know, what I really found exciting about developing these, developing these characters, whether it was, because it was also a skill I wanted to develop, you know, if I were to, because I, I have some scripts and I want to, you know, I want to work on a movie and I want to work on a show. It's like exciting to work on these characters and then work on other characters and see how, if I can entertain an audience consistently for a long period of time with the short form content, I should be able to do that with a longer form piece of content as well. Um, so it's, it's been great to be able to, go through those motions. Absolutely. And to jump in a little bit more. So how much one of our other questions that we were wondering is, well, how much do you write that is then not used? And is that going to end up maybe, OK, hey, I got that ready for, you know, season two or, you know, something else. What A what lot, you a lot, actually, if, if, kind of like an example right now, I'm working on some holiday content. And so the series, I'll give a little uh, sneak peek, is oh. you know, I move out because I want to go pursue, mu pursue music. So I'm trying to tie, tie in my, my music as well, right? Because that's one of my main focuses. So Josh moves out and then turns out he's like living with his girlfriend. And then she shows up because she has a terminal disease, but it's not actually terminal at the end of the story. And um, she like does all the holiday decorating and it's all these interactions. But as I'm writing all this content, um, I start, it's just kind of like, it's, it's a domino effect. I'm like, oh, well, what if long-term, you know, she decides that she's going to move to LA too, you know, whatever it might be, I start coming up with more ideas. And I end up, the last script I wrote, I ended up grabbing that and writing a totally different series that I'll use in two months. And then I actually found more passion in writing that. So then I had to like recenter and be like, okay, holiday, holiday content. Um, and right now I'm just kind of putting that in. And at the end of the day, I generally film um, almost all the lines I write because it's like if I'm gonna write it and I think it, it could be humorous then why not film it as an extra you know 10 15 20 minutes and then in editing I generally cut out about I'd say about 50 percent of what I write so yeah do you, just out of curiosity Jenny I'm just gonna ask a question particularly on the writers because I know we're, we work with the writers guild and we have a lot of writers here too is when you do the writing Josh do you do you do it, is it just really just on your own and you just kind of put a like a pen to paper and then you just kind of finesse it there? Or do you actually, you know, actually do lines with others, you know, and collaborate with or other people? There's a community of people who actually just do the writing as well. So I, I've tried writing with other people and in the past, because, you know, like I, like I said, I have have the management firm but also just I'm very involved in the community and I, I'm very blessed to have a lot of creative people around me and so I definitely bounce off a lot of my ideas or my writing but I've found that what works for me is when I lock myself in my room and I have zero distractions and I just write down my ideas and it's normally you know like right before I go to bed I kind of just zone out I get into the character I kind of just visualize I like to visualize everything the entire video the the entirety of you know the entire series whatever it might be and then once I'm satisfied with how the beginning and ending and everything in between works I just jot it down and then I actually um, I do write it out like a script so I'll have you know scene each character the lines which also makes production easier uh, easier um, it makes production a lot easier once we start shooting um, so I, I, you know a shot list um, which I've developed yeah hi Kitty uh, which I've developed recently. Um, but yeah, that's generally my process. And writing with others, I do bounce off a lot of my ideas and, and sometimes I'll do research. Um, not always, but let's say if I'm doing like, uh, like I did a Mother's Day skit, right? And so the last Mother's Day video I did was, um, I think it was like the perfect accident or something like that. And, or the, the Mother's Day surprise. And so I did some research on what it's like to be a single mother, uh, what it's like for um, mothers to go through, you know, you know, potentially having a kid at a, at a young age, and then grabbing that and then, you know, kind of put, 
uh, working it with the character and then writing that out. So I'll do research, but with writing with others, I like to do it solo generally. Um, Cause I, I don't love the pressure of like, everybody's like, you know, I like to bring something to the table and then discuss it and, and then come back again. That's generally how I like to do it. I, I like how you were saying that you were doing that research and that kind of ties back in with what Ariel was saying about the authenticity of the voice. So I was like, oh, well, there you go. No wonder you're with Bloom, you know? So, um, how early on are you then collaborating with Ariel and the team at Bloom? Or is that more of a, look, I've already finished everything. Here's the pretty shiny package. I mean, it just depends like uh, from, you know, we've worked with Josh on some events and other panels and everything as well. In terms of, you know, actual creative production of certain content, it can start really early on. Um, if it is, depending on, you know, what kind of brand it is and the conversations we have is what is the story here, right? So does it make sense aligning with this creator and making sure that they have their own voice? So a lot of times we have a back and forth to make sure that the creator has their own vision for the, you know, the specific content that is being requested, but also aligning it with the brand voice. And that's why, you know, whenever we talk early on, it's, it's trying to make sure there's a good fit there. Because if you're trying to push two different stories and two different voices, you, you don't see that. But when you do have it together, there's a lot of synergy and, and trying to make that voice amplified and to make that message heard to the audience uh, of the creator, but also the brand. So that's something I think it, it's definitely been evolving. There are a lot of brands that push, you know, we, this is what we want. And, and I'm, I'm sure that <laughs> Josh has also experienced that where, you know, it, it's just really about bringing those voices together. Like, how can we, how can this be a collaboration rather than just pushing something? And, and that goes both ways. So it's, it, it's part of the process of, you know, we, we always talk about in, in the traditional form of entertainment, there are so many writers and so many collaborators. Well, it's the same with, with the social digital side as well. There's a lot of pieces that come in and, and someone might just see a hashtag sponsored or, or hashtag, you know, paid ad or whatever, but there's so much creative that actually goes into making sure it's aligned. I love it. That dovetails into like two of our, our, upcoming slides. Oh, it's so natural. I love this. Um, but so uh, two main things that, you know, my friend has been texting me all day. Don't forget to ask us. Quite, okay, I will ask, you know, but um, how do you get so many followers? How did that start out? Is that you? Is that you and Ariel at Bloom? How are you? Yeah. How do you curate them? What's the strategy? How much time do you take? Can we borrow them from you? What, you know, let's get down to brass tacks. So. Over. Um, so my experience with building followers. So I also did a lot of artist development with the creators that I worked with. And I even do that now without any type of contract. Like my main focus right now, just kind of to add to this is I be, being in LA, um, I see a lot of struggles within the community of finding resources, finding people who can help, who have the right intentions. So right now what I do is if I see someone with talent, no strings attached, I'm here to help you. So you know, if I'm, you know, if you need help with developing content, you know, coming up with creative ideas, kind of going off with what um, Ariel was saying about working with brands, having that authentic voice. It's like, there is, there is kind of like a good guideline on how you can build an audience and how you can work with brands. Um, my thing is I wasn't doing well on social media. Like I was living at home 18 and my parents supported me with whatever I wanted to do, but my content wasn't performing well. I studied the algorithm, what was working, what people wanted. And I made a new profile, I posted one video and I was just lucky and it blew up. Like it literally had a quarter of a million likes overnight and I had like 50,000 followers in one day and I was like, oh my goodness. So I started posting every day and it just didn't stop. And then I started merging into YouTube and then um, that happened. And then Instagram was also supporting me through IG, um, uh, IGTV. And I currently have a contract with them also right now for a series and everything. But it's mainly, I think, about putting out content that is relatable to what's going on with current events and tying it in with your authentic self. And it's the same thing with when you're working with brands. It's like, you know, you have a, a if you're working with a good brand that has an amazing ethos or they have a lot of different parts of themselves that are marketable, you know, if you're working with a creator like myself who makes skits or is able to produce different types of content that are inspirational, 
sometimes you have to trust that creator. And um, like Ariel was saying, is having a collaboration. So now when I work with brands or, um, you know, when I was developing artists and then developing their relationship with brands, it's always like you pitch what you know is going to work for your audience, how you're going to integrate it organically into your content and, you know, make someone laugh using the product. It's not that hard. I mean, you know, if, if you can write, you know, con you know, a skit and you can integrate something into it, there's fun ways to do that. And so, um, I've been blessed to be able to do that with a lot of brands. Invisalign has been an amazing brand that I've worked with. I've produced a lot of content for them and their uh, uh, retainer brand, Vivera. I just did a video where like the retainers like jump off the counter and they like rescue the relationship. They roll all the way back to the house and, you know, stuff like that. And it's great content, not only to go on my profile, but it's amazing content that brands can repurpose and use if they want to whitelist the content and you know, put it out there for their brand. Because again, it's that collaboration. It should be a piece of content that can apply to my audience and also apply to their consumers. So yeah, that's kind of how I'm- Okay, great. And so- um, By the way, I love Invisalign. <laughs> <laughs> they're great to sponsor for us too. exactly i know you know um, we'll have big shiny teeth with our invisible i know i you needed know, it discuss, i needed it you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> so um so josh a couple of questions and actually it kind of all ties in together as we know so you're talking about doing the brand partnerships and so um i do want to finish a couple of questions we had on that slide about like well you were saying you were posting every day and so okay, you're still posting every day, but then we also want to know like how, um, you know, how and when did Bloom XO get involved as far as getting those brands on board and the sponsorship and, yeah. you know, how early are they coming on board? Because Ariel, as you and I had discussed uh, in our, one of our previous talks, you know, the sponsorship, the ad that you're seeing, the branded content, loved the gum, by the way, that was so funny, Josh, um, with the date. I was like, oh, <laughs> um, so it was relatable and amusing, you know, we enjoyed it. Uh, but so we're seeing that lovely little final product, but we're not seeing all of the, the stuff that went in underneath to create this yeah. very enjoyable spot. So give me the, the background, everybody. What's the business side of that? We need to know business of creating all this stuff. Yeah. I mean, for making content, um, so, you know, like I work with different brands, I work with different agencies, I work with different management firms that are not exclusive. The, the main thing about, you know, like when you're growing your audience and when you're putting out this content, um, there's, there's a lot that's involved. So there's everything from contracts, negotiation, pitching ideas, discussing the marketing campaigns, um, and really developing that. I, I do want to hand over to Ariel because I feel like she'll have something really good to add to this and then. I'll, I'll pitch back in. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you brought up a lot of interesting questions and points, Jen, because it's like, it's so dependent on the specific project. Like I wish there was like a one answer fits all. <laughs> We'd, um, have a but slide. We'd have a slide and be like, take a picture, everybody. This is, it. <laughs> this is the <laughs> magic key. Exactly. Right. So, I mean, it comes down to really looking at what the you know, very early on, the first thing that we look at is what is the goal of the campaign from a, from a marketing like brand perspective. So it starts from, you know, sometimes the, the goal in terms of more of like metric wise is engagement, or sometimes it's more just brand awareness or brand visibility. So those are some of the things that it starts with. And then it depends on like the creative brief that goes along with it. Um, going back to kind of the evolution of how this has changed is before, I mean, it was just, okay, how are we going to send this creator like a product, you know? And now it, there's so much storytelling behind it because that's, there. there's obviously with competition, people feel like they have to differentiate. So that's a reason that it's evolved into the stage. But um, it, it really starts with a creative brief and understanding, you know, like, it, for example, on the film side, since we're talking here more about the entertainment side, it's starting with you know who is the target audience of the film and then from there understanding what that means you know if it's fans of dramas fans of comedies and specifically you know it's it goes back into it's it's more than the demographics it's that was the traditional now it's about psychographics and personalities and it, there's a lot of a deeper understanding that goes into the creative brief and the campaign process and then from there, there's a lot of back and forth to make sure that you know, from the influencer side that we have the right fit for it. 
Um, in terms of like Josh collaborating and things like that, we, um, I know that Michael and I had discussed this prior to the panel too, but we did have um, Josh come to the Forever Purge Universal event, which was really fun as well. And um, again, it comes down to, especially when it comes to events, it comes down to finding the people that would genuinely have fun at these events and experiences rather than so completely like different, like for something like a horror event, like you're not going to invite like a very lifestyle fashion-y, like rosy dozy type of aesthetic Instagram influencer. So it, it, there's just a variety in, in, in that aspect. Um, if I, can I, I don't know if that helped answer the question, but <laughs> totally it did. If I can jump in to kind of get a little extra clarification, because it sounds very similar to how when you're developing your pitch deck and you're developing your pitch for a film or a TV, you're going, look, these are our comp shows. This is our audience. This is, you know, so it's a lot of the similar understanding so that you can go in and be that self-aware of the project that you're pitching, whether that's yourself or the TV show or the brand event. So I'm, I'm appreciating that. Oh, okay, wait, I knew more about that than I, I realized I did. So fantastic. Yeah. And just like to add to what Ariel's saying, it's like, cause I've worked with a lot of different brands in the past and when we're like, I've, I'm excited to see how it's evolving because again, a lot of agencies have failed brands. A lot of brands have failed in campaigns um, a lot. And, you know, sometimes they put too much pressure on the creators, but they don't realize that they're demanding this list of things that are absolutely they're not applicable at all to the content, right? And mm -hmm. so now I see a lot of platforms so like TikTok's doing this, um, Meta is doing that. Like a lot of people are consulting with creators now to put together briefs to make sure that that voice is authentic and that you can feel that through your content. So I'm excited to see that. Like I've been doing that lately a lot. Even Luan, my close friend, she's an amazing creator. She's like working with brands like Coca-Cola and like really consulting with them and telling them, this is what we need from you. This is what we need to make the content that's gonna work on our profile, but also um, feel genuine to our audience. And that's exciting. And then also like kind of um, touching, cause I think you were talking about like, you know, working different platforms. Um, Meta, you know, has Facebook, Instagram, everything. They actually just sent me to the Jingle Ball last week, which was absolutely amazing. But it's difficult balancing out content for Reels and balancing out content for TikTok and YouTube and Instagram posts, Instagram stories. And, you know, when you're doing it all yourself, it can be very overwhelming. And um, I think that's why, you know, for me, I've like tried to, and I'm currently working on developing a team. Like I'm trying to find someone that I hire for sales. I'm trying to find an assistant that I can hire um, to help me with my schedule, to be able to be more productive. And I think that's, that's something that a lot of creators need to be educated on is that you, you shouldn't have to be afraid of building a team around you to be able to do what you do best. Um, and so that's something I've, I've been trying to focus on and, and I found like helps a lot. Um, it's, it's a lot to handle. Well, then it also, it sounds like it would give you a lot more opportunity than to create the content that you're, you're known for. Right. You know, and, yeah. but it was interesting. You, you brought up the point of, and I think Jen and, um, earlier talking about, it's like, you can't like as marketers, for example, right. Like I remember years ago as marketers, we would literally write down, like, here's what you influencer would say. Right. And. It just never, it, first of all, you know, the, the content creators are like, well, I'm not necessarily going to do that. We might've been able to do it in the past, but it didn't really come organically and approached. And then it's the audiences that can kind of feel it and sense it, that it's not coming from like a really true place. Um, I thought your example, I really, you talked about the um, Universal Pictures, the Forever Purge. I know, is it okay if I share that link in the, in the chat? Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, of course. Okay, and cool. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say Josh mentioned this and I thought it was great is that the more individualization of the creative is something that we're seeing every day more and more. Whereas like with what you mentioned, Michael, to have something where it's standardized and it's almost like the amount of the creators or whoever's on the other side of it can have completely different tone, messaging, audience, and it's it really needs to be personalized. So to, to really have the collaboration early on to see what that content looks like, it's really important. Um, and I thought it was fascinating because we've dealt with a lot of those even in the last few months of just trying to kind of, it, it starts off with a lot of back and forth and communication, but making sure that that is something the audience will actually understand. Because if it, I'm sure Josh knows this too. It's like, 
if your audience is looking at a post and they know that that's not your voice because they know you so well, <laughs> sometimes more than you even realize. So, um, and, and that's a difference between kind of when you're the topic of this, the difference between like TikTok and traditional is that when you watch a, a film in a theater, it's, you know, how you don't see the, the characters every single day. Whereas with Josh and the characters he creates, it's people can click on his Instagram story when they wake up in the morning and when they sleep and it's, it's continuous, right? Um, the touch points to the audience. So that's another uh, fascinating difference too. Yeah. If I can jump back in, there were a couple of things I wanted to get a little more clarification on. So Josh, um, I love it. You already answered, how are you dealing with the burnout? Cause people have been putting in some questions. So yeah, cause you're, you're spinning every plate in the line there. So yeah, getting your team and finding those that with whom you can collaborate as creators, you know, thumbs up on that one, you know? Um, and so two other questions that I thought were quite interesting. Um, do you batch content? So how much do you create at one time? And then, you know, cut into the individual episodes and uh, are you using separate content? Are you changing it up depending on the platform? Yeah, no, those are great questions. I'm looking at them right now. Mm -hmm. um, it's, so a lot of people, everybody has their own process. I think everybody individually works in a different way. For me personally, I don't plan my content. For me, it's what inspires me in the moment because what I might plan out in two months, I might not be inspired to create in two months. Mm -hmm. And then I'm not gonna make the videos and then I'm gonna be stressed because I don't know what I wanna make and then you know trying to fit everything in. Um, I think it's smart and, and I, do, I do this also is like planning out you know, bit like the bigger picture things. So like, okay, I want this character to evolve in this way. Um, I want to try this style of content in two months. I want to try to merge, like for me right now, working on music um, and also going to production. Oh, I want to like work on like longer storytelling things where I, I have myself as a character, as like an actor and then close friends of mine. You know, it's it's like doing that. When I, when I prep my content, it's generally a, a one week process. Like I plan out the, the overline of the script. I'll spend a day or two writing if I feel inspired, you know, it's always on, on the back of my mind and then I'll edit it and, and post it. Um, but every piece of content is different generally. Um, I do like to repurpose my content though. So I will produce a, and this is what I've been doing was what has worked for me. YouTube is, Thankfully, I'm able to post vertical videos that are only four minutes long, three to four minutes long, and they tend to do really well. And then what I do is I write out the script to make sense as a series if I cut it up, or if I know that that's not doing well on my channel right now, doing epi episodic things, I'll write out the content to have like a lot of jump cut humor. So I can just make one video for that, post it on TikTok, post it on Reels, post it on IGTV, post it on shorts, Snapchat, repurpose that content. And then if there's like an idea, I'm like, oh, this would be a fun, like quick video I can make. I'll just, you know, make that and post it and see where, it, you know, where it lands on what platform and how it works. But um, I do like to repurpose my content. I think it's, you might as well, if you're gonna work hard on something, you need to definitely find a way to like, you know, just use it to the max and, and be able to get as many eyes on it as possible. So um, I've been doing that for a couple of years now. It's, it's, uh, Great. Actually, I love how you're like dovetailing right into my next question. Josh, thank you. Uh, so, because what I also wanted to circle back to was, okay, so you had this explosion of followers and then you kept getting more and more and more because Christmas kept coming, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> and so as you're building this audience, are how directly are you trying to engage to get new followers? Are you... Uh, also, you know, presumably depending on your followers to say, hey, man, my friend here, you need to follow this guy. And hey, so, you know, it keeps growing exponentially in that degree as well. And then follow up question on that also is as you're getting so many followers, does the quality of your follower continue to to be an important factor as you're growing? And how do you deal with that kind of a thing? So I have been. I've been pretty blessed to be able to build a pretty strong bond and connection with my audience um, through my characters. You know, whenever I post, like sometimes I'll take breaks and, and you know, I, literally I actually had some fans come up to me a couple of weeks ago and they were like, oh, we're like ready for the next Mama Penny video. And like, that was 
it was like the fact that they knew that I hadn't posted one in a couple of weeks to me, was like incredible. And then like the mom was like, yeah, we sit down and watch. It was a family from Utah. And so then I'm like, okay, like, this is amazing. I'm, I'm glad I'm able to do this. My main issue I've found right now is I've tried to do different styles of content and I've learned in the past two months from a series I did on IGTV, it didn't necessar necessarily perform the best. And so it was a learning process. I put out great content. I enjoyed it, had fun with it. And now I'm getting back into, okay, I'm putting out more comedy skits, the holiday seasons here, New Year's, but how can I find like a, a, a healthy middle ground um, and a happy medium for, for you know, the type of content I'm making? And so right now it's like, okay, I want to be able to reach an audience that can appreciate music and sometimes making that family friendly or like comedy skits doesn't necessarily fall in that. So if they see a cover that I post, it could be a good cover. They're just kind of like, oh, cool. Like that's a cover. Like, where's the skit? Where's Mama Penny? Like that's always the comment. Like where's Mama Penny? So got to do the music with the towel on the head and then the, there you go. <laughs> Exactly. So like, I literally released a song that was called, um, it's the most stressful time of the year. And I did it as mom. Yeah. Right. So there's fun yeah. ways to incorporate that. But I think like, if you really truly want to rebrand, I don't necessarily want to rebrand. I think I want to have like a separate page where I can post stuff like that. I make new channels. So now what I'm doing is I have a separate account that's starting to do well, where I post covers, where I don't have to like be stressed and I just make a separate piece of content. And then I'm able to satisfy both audiences and then I'll find ways to merge those, you know, those audiences and see, you know, kind of like pull the people who love music from this side and then the people who love comedy skits from this side and try to merge it all into one big brand. And it's, it takes time. It takes time for sure. Sure. And what were some of your earlier strategies to get all of these followers coming along? Um, so I would, my comedy skits, relatability helped. So anything that was relatable was doing well. So POVs, you know, Ariel was like, it was like really interesting to hear how you explain this because you were like, oh, comedy used to be like, oh, the comedy creator. But now you have like the comedy POV creator. You have the scripted creator. You have the vlog creator, like the, the storyteller. Like you have all these different types of creators and which is amazing. Um, but you kind of also have to find what's trending. So like for me, Visco was like a huge trend, you know, a couple of years ago. And so I integrated that into my content that was already doing well, my characters, my mom, Penny. And that blew up. Like it had like, I think in total, like, I think it was like 50 million views across platforms. I think even more, like it was like 60 million views and because it was relatable to that. So I think as long as you're following the trends um, and then finding a way to make it authentic to the content you're already making and make it different, right? So like expanding off of that trend, that's a great strategy to grow to your audience. And then that will allow you to build an audience that will also promote the normal content you already put out. Um, but that's what's always worked for me. Great. And so to loop Ariel back, thank you, Josh, to loop Ariel back in on that. Ariel, do you, how much do you as the creative marketing exec, and I should, I'm ignoring that Michael's a creative marketing exec. <laughs> but no, so Ariel's the one here. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, sorry. Um, but so Ariel, how much involvement do you have in growing that audience and growing the followers? Yeah, I mean, I'd also love to hear Michael's perspective from like a more traditional, you know, part of it as well. But, um, you know, it really is about kind of going, it's tapping into the true part of the personality. I mean, we've really seen, it sounds cliche, you know, but really trying to find the the true interest of that creator and making sure they can tap into that organically. And I, this is one of the things I really see as a difference between traditional and kind of the content creator side um, is you know, with what's very traditional, it's constantly going back through notes and, and trying to fit this certain mold and, and kind of get through like checkpoints and green light. And with the influencer side, it's it's more of, you know, if, if something doesn't work out, it's more of like trusting the content creator because they know their audience best and going back to like the relatability and what stays true because it, you can't tell, like, I can't tell, for example, like someone like Josh or any any creator, like, I think you should do this because this is going to do better. It's like he knows his audience best. He's grown and evolved with them. Um, but I think from just more of like if it's branded content, generally looking at it from what's going to perform better. I mean, our team has, you know, a whole strategy team dedicated to TikTok and understanding the TikTok trends of this week. And, you know, we've put together so many decks and presentations for like studio clients that 
okay, within these three days, like this is the list of all the things that we found that are TikTok trends that are happening. And these are the ones that like the cast should participate in for like that TikTok page. So from that perspective, you can't really plan too far in advance as well, because as you know, it's everything is changing. A trend that could have been happening a week ago, people are like, that's old now. <laughs> and I'm sure Josh is like, yeah, that's, it, you can't, how many drafts can you keep of like the same sound, right? <laughs> It, it, it used to be where you had two or three days to jump on a trend. Um, sometimes even a week, a trend would last a week. But now it's like, oh, this is a trend. I literally, if I want my content to perform well, I have like three hours to make this video. If you wanted to do it, no, you literally could be at a coffee shop. And you're like, I need to go home and film this because it's the biggest trend and I need to, to jump on that. So yeah, it's definitely in the moment. Exactly. And that, that goes to show you that from like the influencer side, the fact that Josh can just say, I'm going to do this right now mm -hmm. is very different from like the corporate side, because there's so many approvals you need. And so what you kind of have to position yourself is planning that in advance. And then when the trends are coming, just being able to go super fast and say like, these are like a few general ones we can hop on within this week. And let's say we're contacting on Monday and like, let's get it up by, you know, Wednesday, but it's true. If, if you have to participate early on in the trends in order to kind of get that window, if, if it's too late, people feel like it's stale. So I think from, from the kind of looking from the brand perspective, it's really important to script that out early on, be prepared to have that back and forth very quickly and not, you know, wait to get to the approval stage because at that yeah. point it'll be way too late. No, you're right. And I think from a, like, when you look at more traditional with, with film and TV, it is, it really is the scale. I mean, movies sometimes take two years, you know, to be able to do it. Whereas Josh, we're talking about hours, right? You know, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very different way of doing it. But I think the interesting thing from like key, like some of the key learnings more like uh, for film and TV is, is just that ability and willingness of TikTokers to just kind of just put things out there to see what sticks. You know, and, you know, and kind of finding out what lines work, what, um, what comedy works. I mean, always, I'm always seeing like comedians do this a lot. They're always going out on Twitter and just trying lines, right? Like, and just kind of putting it out there, seeing what works. And, you know, it's kind of like doing the, you know, kind of doing the, you know, the, the comedy troupe of like when they do like the, you know, the underground bars and just kind of like just testing out content, right? You know, and that's what it really is. That's what Josh you're doing, but just in a lot more of a public profile, right? Not, it's not just limited like 15 people in some bar, you know, giving a shot like on a Thursday night, you know, you're actually, you know, putting it out there for everyone and anyone to be able to make content, but it's that willingness. I think it's also, it's also that willingness just to be willing to, fail right like it as you said there are certain things that you know you're very proud of and not to say that it wasn't like it was a failure but it didn't take off as much as you would want right and and being able to be comfortable or willing to try that out i think when you're dealing with you know unfortunately when you're dealing with you know tv budgets and film budgets and millions of dollars on the line you have less of a so and there's going to be a lot more to your point ariel a lot more um you know uh, checks and balances put in there and approvals right but i think there is but again, going back to it, I think there's some things where you can kind of like hopefully try things on the side, you know, to see kind of what works and what doesn't. Uh, I, we have a couple of really interesting questions that people are asking. So uh, thank you, Lilith and uh, Esther. I think I'm trying to read and look and everything at the same time. Um, but Lilith was specifically asking you, Josh, if you could tell them more about the algorithm you used uh, to get so many followers so quickly, if you can dive into that a little bit deeper. Yes. Okay. So I, the algorithm is so different now than what it used to be. Um, just kind of like a brief breakdown of like what yeah. I studied and what worked for me was long form content on TikTok at the time was working really well. Um, new profiles were being pushed and anything with high resolution was working. So I applied all of that to my content that I already wanted to make and it did well. Um, and now there's, there's so, there are literally so many different, um, opinions on what works and what doesn't work. Um, but what I see that continues to work is like, if you're putting out high resolution content and, and, but sometimes like the very raw content, you know, works like just like picking up your phone and recording, I think, you know, algorithmically on different platforms, if we want to kind of break it down to small things like text is really working text to speech um you know really just uh making that long form content what what's relatable i think 
is always works. So if someone can relate to it, it's generally gonna do well and what's trending. So being aware of what's working currently, applying that to your content and you know, there are small things like that text-to-speech or using new filters, right, that everybody's using, those generally do well, or new audios. That's another thing the algorithm picks up. Um, you know, if, if someone's, if a lot of people are starting to put out this content and it's starting to do well, it's gonna continue to promote that. So if you see something that's working, then you should probably jump on that train and start doing it yourself. Um, whether it's using the audio, using the filter, whatever it might be. Um, so it's about being aware. You and It's a lot of work because it's like, okay, I have to make the content, but I also have to be actively on my phone. And it's like, oh, what about like my mental health and like not always being in this world of like having to be on my phone 24 seven. And it's, it's difficult. It's like, you know, when the sun sets, you've got a new trend going on than when you do in the morning. So it's like, when do I have this time for myself to relax? But I think just not stressing about it is, is the main thing. Don't overwhelm yourself. That's super important. Um, there's a balance, um, but also, you know, also making new friends within the space is big because a lot of friends will be aware of what you're not. Like I literally could go to dinner and someone's like, oh, did you see this new video where someone did this and that? And I'm like, I didn't. I They're like, oh yeah, everybody's doing it. I'm like, I've been on TikTok all day and I haven't seen it. So it's it's about making friends within the space, like being social and like asking your friends, like, oh, do you know what's trending or watching? An oh, here's a good tip. If you really want to see, really being active on the people you follow, like whether it's like creators who are starting to grow or creators who are already doing well and observing their behavior. Cause that, that taught me a lot, even now, like what's working for them, even when they post. So going on a portion of your feed where you are, where your friends are posting and observing that and learning from that and then applying that to your content so that hopefully you can be on the explore and also be on your friend's feed. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, can, I, can I just do one thing? Can I just, I want to address Nidia's question too, because I think Nidia, you asked a really interesting question. Um, you know, and it's, I don't, the, the, the real answer is we don't know because this is more through TikTok. We don't have TikTok as a company represented here um, to be able to, to, to be able to answer that. But I think you bring up a really interesting point um, because it's like, you know, how, how does TikTok in itself um, get support? Um, and it kind of ties a little bit into, there's a there's this really interesting article that Ariel, you and I were talking about, particularly when you talk about rest of world, you know, talk about even outside Western cultures, you know, and, and um, those that are not really seen and being able to be represented properly. Um, and I'm going to share the link in the in the chat and you could take a look at it, but they kind of look at what's what TikTok is really known for is being able to get really authentic voices out there and the stories. Um, I think, you know, to answer your question is that, you know, is it is it worth taking your audience to TikTok and depending on wh where, where is your audience, but if TikTok with, you know, a billion people, you're going to find audiences out there, you know, and it comes down to the, the creation of the content, the quality of the content as for what TikTok, you know, what, what TikTok supports or not, unfortunately, that goes beyond the, <laughs> around the scope of the panel right here, you know, and I think we would love to be able to have one because we actually reached out to TikTok to see if they'd be able to be part of it. And so we'd love to be able to have that. Um, but what I want to do is like share this article in the link because it kind of talks about the authenticity of it. It talks about how certain groups of people, particularly India, when you look at from that population, how they actually were able to get a lot of underrepresented voices being able to be heard. And then all of a sudden it wasn't. And it, I, I've, I have like lots of discussions about it with other people here. I'm not on this panel, but just overall in the work environment. Um, that if you ever want to talk further, I'd be glad to, you know, and you have my information, but I think you bring up good points. Unfortunately, it's, 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 we don't have TikTok here to be able to answer that mostly, but um, these are, these are really good questions though. So hopefully, okay, now we've got another panel planned, future panel coming up, yep. TikTok will be here. They couldn't do it today, but they were interested in, in coming in. Um, so I'm, I'm going to shift our topic slightly because I found these to be very interesting questions, Michael, when we're talking about like, okay, so two things. Most people, when we're creating the short form content, um, are short form content creators looking to branch over into long form, like we've seen with successful films, et cetera, or is that kind of up to the individual? And then kind of on the reverse side of that, for people who are wanting to make like, uh, you know, rip trailers and stuff like, here's my, my three minute video, my two minute video to show you the tone and style, et cetera, for the full length film, TV, et cetera, is creating kind of the TikTok version of it or, you know, the, the short form content 
version of it, is that going to be helpful as a trailer for a full length show? How do the two, you know, kind of intermix and, and what's the best use of people's efforts moving forward with their content? I've stunned you. I've stunned you all. This is fantastic. <laughs> and that's the panel, everybody. Have a good night. Yes. <laughs> um, kind of like just my experience, because um, we, I produced a reality show. Um, more, it's more of like, a, I just wanted to document the experience of being a manager, running a creator house, you know, being during COVID and everything going on in a separate state and like, creating content, the business side of everything. And we filmed everything for four months straight. Uh, you know, I hired multiple cinema cinematographers, a director I was directing, and it was an amazing, amazing experience. But we produced this show and right now we're in the process of editing, but it's like, there is this struggle and there, uh, uh, and this gap between really, I think creators having resources. Uh, even for myself, I've had to do a lot of legwork to try to connect with people who could give me honest feedback on the show or help me with distribution. You know, it's, it's a whole other world in itself. I, I've learned that it is, it's a totally different world. Um, but I think there is an amazing opportunity for a lot of one creators. Not everyone wants to branch out. A lot of creators are very content and very happy with what they're doing, but there are a lot of artists out there um, who are wanting to make content like myself, that's higher production, longer form. And so being able to partner with production companies or um, even creative directors, whoever it might be that can help facilitate that is amazing, right? And um, being able to get that feedback. And then also for production companies, it's like, if you see an artist or a creator out there who's putting out amazing content, they could either be an amazing director, they could be an amazing writer, they could be an amazing actor, or singer, whatever it might be, there's a lot of opportunity to connect with them. And you'll realize that a lot of these creators are very self-sufficient and, and driven and, and have developed a lot of skills that can be, you know, very useful. Um, but I think it's just about really keeping your eye open. Um, and, but yeah, definitely creators, I feel are, are trying to get into different, like even myself, like I'm taking acting lessons and doing everything I can to grow um, and then see where that takes me. So I guess my question, I'm Jen, I'm going to jump in and ask a question. So Please. just for Josh, do you want to be in the movies and on a TV show? Or, I, and the reason I ask that, yeah, okay. Because yeah. sometimes I find like certain creators don't want, because they're like, you have to give up, you know, as, as Ariel was even talking about, you have to kind of give up, certain, you know, certain creative control, right? Because right now you're saying you, you write your own stuff, you kind of test it out, but it's really all on your own. And then on like a bigger TV movies, you have multiple writers, multiple, you know, it's like producers and directors. And it's like giving up that control and some don't, you know, and you, you lose sometimes probably followers, you know, because all of a sudden yeah. you're shifting over. But do you find for you, I know you said you're willing to, do you find that your, your friends and colleagues within the, like within the influencer world, are they, do they, do they have the same goals or do you see there's like a, like a split between certain people like life living in the world that they're in right now versus kind of a more traditional? I would say that the people that I'm friends with mainly, um, it's pretty much, oh, sorry, give me one second. I, okay. I'll connect my doctor. I'm gonna connect this really quick so I don't, no you know, cause my cat disconnected the router in the last panel. Yes, that's right. I don't want but, that. But I, yeah, but I think also just to jump in, like Jen, what's really interesting, you know, for me to hear, and I think also for the audience who's all here, because we have people who are actors, writers, producers, filmmakers, you know, it's like all within the creative process with film and TV is like, you know, part of this panel idea was trying to figure out how do you bridge that gap, right? And it's really interesting to hear you, Josh, saying, you know, you're right now, you don't want to get burnt out and you're looking for the help, you know, for like producers and being able to, or, or possibly even writers, you know, kind of like helping kind of scale these great ideas, you know, and it's more of what will be really interesting. I don't know the answer to this is, but how do you, how do we, and hopefully maybe panels like this and people can chat about it and meet each other is you know connecting the two worlds because you know there's a lot of writers and producers out there that want to keep on doing work and creating great content you know regardless of whether it's tv and film but also taking great ideas from tiktok and facebook but also i also hear very often influencers are like and but you're 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 basically um josh kind of 
you know, confirming something that I, or, or basically think, um, saying something that I used to think is that I always thought that you always want to just do it on your own, but in a way you're open to the collaboration, you know, from others to be able to help out, you know, and right. getting those two, two worlds together. Yeah, no, very, very much so. I find that a lot of the people that I associate with and a lot of my friends, even the creators I was managing, like Ace, um, you know, just part of the, the Bloom magazine as well, Ace Cross Crook. Um, she started out as an actress and didn't have too much success in that. And, you know, social media was a great outlet and she had just started and I helped her and she acts in all her videos. And so I feel like a lot of creators, a lot of creators are looking to expand. I mean, the reason I got into even making content on social media is because I wanted to, you know, act in a show or be a, a crazy character in a show. Do you know what I mean? Like express myself that way or move into the music industry, which is what I'm working on as of right now. And then I also learned, I love producing. Like I love putting teams together. I love throwing out ideas. And um, sometimes I don't want to have, if I have a good idea or I want to work on teams, sometimes I don't want to have to do all that. Like I started a production company and it, and it can be a lot of work, a lot of work having to run a team. And sometimes you just want to be a creative in a, in a room and, um, just be involved in projects and you know even if it's like short films whatever it might be almost every creator that I'm friends with is in an acting class or is working even in like sh like uh, they, like film festivals and things like that which is amazing to see unfortunately you know just like in anything like in mainstream or you know a lot of creators want that it's not necessarily you know if, if you're not the best at it it's something you can develop but it's like you know if you have a passion for it and you're working for it and like it can happen and so I've seen a lot of creators have a lot of success and I've seen a lot of artists use social media to promote what they do um, or be an escape for them. Because also what, what's very sad and I've seen it firsthand in the film industry is a rejection every single day. The amount of times you're told no is painful. And like secondhand, I've seen a lot of people go into you know, deep depression or like second guess themselves and social media has allowed them to express themselves with their art and grow from that. And, it, and it's almost like a, a really just a breath of fresh air. And um, and so it's exciting to kind of see how creators are growing in that and also other artists are using social media to express themselves. Um, but to like kind of fill that gap, I think it's, if a production company or a network, or whatever it might be, want, sees potential in an artist, it's as simple as reaching out and you better believe that that creator is gonna wanna be involved. Um, Cause a lot of creators don't have the help or they're a part of, if I'm being honest, they're a part of these management firms. A lot of creators are signing to these management firms where their main focus is social media and they do not care about the artist development, the artist development. They'll make them sign 360 deals. They're like, oh, we'll develop you as an artist, but we just mm -hmm. want you to keep posting TikTok videos because that's what's going to make us money, right? Mm -hmm. That's been the biggest issue I've seen too. And so a lot of creators feel stuck. They feel afraid to even grow, even if they have the potential or they have the talent to do it. Josh. Definitely. One thing I just want to really quickly say that's it's interesting. Uh, one of the other panels that Josh was also on, um, Johnny was also on. It was a studio panel we did. And um, Johnny is part of Josh's uh, TikTok house. That's amazing. And he was mentioning something I thought really resonated with this topic. Um, he was mentioning that he came to, you know, really passionate about acting and to come to LA um, from, I believe, Texas. And he, he mentioned that they had asked him or something, you know, if you get like a big movie or something tomorrow, like, will you stop posting on TikTok? And he said, you know, I would love to act. I would love to do these traditional opportunities, but I'm still going to be posting on TikTok every day because that's something I love to do. And it's part of who I am. So I, I think that there's definitely room for space and space for both of these in a way that allows the creator to also be authentic to their audience and the things that they want to do. Because again, it's, it's that access to your audience. That's at the, you know, at the touch of your fingertips, you can just yeah. post something and connect with them. And it's when, when you've built that relationship over years, it's, it's really meaningful. It's not just, Oh, this is like a, it's just a business or whatever. It, it becomes personal as well. So. So well said, literally so well said. And that's one. <laughs> And that's the panel. No, <laughs> no, no, exactly. Well, yeah. So she, I know we've asked, we've had a lot of questions yeah, actually, asked and answered. Michael, right? sorry, I want to jump. I'm so sorry. I want to jump in real quick, but actually with a question, because um, a couple people have been asking the same version of the question, which was, okay, here we have screenwriters, we have you know directors, et cetera, in the audience, and they're saying, well, how do I get in touch with either, you know, um, you know, not 
Josh, not necessarily specifically you, pardon me, but, you know, uh, either a creator or perhaps, you know, uh, one of the agencies or so, so that they can also be on the team to help collaborate and create the content, whether it's for a scripted series for an influencer or for a brand or et cetera. Yeah. And is, you know, what's the right process? Yeah. Um, I think it's definitely a lot easier for a production company or director, whoever it might be to reach out to a creator than a creator is, you know, easier for, you know, cause a creator generally doesn't know who to reach out to. Like, even for me, I'm like, when we produce the shows, like, how do I, even right now, like we're editing it. And then like, once it's fully edited, like, what do I do for distribution? Like, I literally, it's like, I have to find a team. I have to find someone. It's a lot, it's a lot to learn, yeah. but it's a simple, every single creator, almost every single one has an email in their bio. They have an email in their bio, Instagram DM. You can just send them a text. Hey, are you interested in this opportunity? And 90% of the time, the creator will want to jump on a quick, you know, 20, 30 minute Zoom call and, you know, hear out the idea and you can go from there. I mean, that I've had a lot of people reach out to me for projects and a lot of, um, uh, like Flight House is an example. They're like a, you know, they're owned by Create Music Group, but they do a lot of content. And so they reach out to creators. They work with creators also because they're like kind of an, an agency, but um, they reach out to creators for content all the time. And I've, you know, been featured, Johnny and I have been featured on their thing. And, um, you know, we did like a little hol uh, Halloween acting show that they fully produced. And I've reached out to creators also for um, another project I'm trying to work on right now. I'm just like, hey, are you interested? This is like what I've done in the past. Um, and, you know, I'd like to, potentially have you involved and keep you in mind. And, you know, even if we host auditions for it, like whatever it might be, like it's, it's very simple just to, to reach out and you'll find that the, the response will be really, really good most of the time. Okay. And should people have kind of more specifics in mind? Like, hey, I, I'm noticing you're doing this character arc for, you know, Philip or whatever and yeah. show the familiarity like they would for kind of any other job audition basically. Yes, 100. I will say this. You will definitely get a lot of solicitations as a creator. It's like, even from brands, it's like, hey, what's up? I'm John. I'm working on this project. There's like no information there. So definitely like send, oh, you know, it's like, oh, I'm working on, I want you to promote my brand. Okay, awesome. What's your brand? Like, can you right. send me a link? I'd appreciate right. a little more information. Um, but yeah, no, just, just making sure you have an outline of what the project is and how you see this person fitting into that project. And if they're interested, they're going to reach back out. Um, kind of like sending over your resume or, or you know, uh, a, a spreadsheet or a doc that kind of has a breakdown of everything that you're working on with any links and, and stuff you've done in the past. I definitely agree. And I think that, I mean, in today's age, it's so much of it is showing your work. And like, if there's any kind of portfolio you have, even if it's not perfect or anything, just being able to share that with people that you think would be interested. And, and at the end of the day, in our connected world, like, you can DM and email a bunch of people that you think would be a right fit. And then if it's a good fit, it'll happen just naturally. And I mean, at this point, everyone is on their email <laughs> every day for hours and hours, especially with COVID. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I, one thing I really admire about Josh as well is he's very just in touch and connected with many people outside of just, you know, comedy or just whatever he does. And that's a really remarkable thing to do just in any field that you're in is just try to connect. And you, you never know, maybe it's in two, three years that there's a potential thing to collaborate on. You don't know, but just trying to connect with people in, in a similar industry or anything at all is great. You know, it's super important. Cause like, if I have like my interest is in music and my fear, like a huge fear of mine was, okay, like I, I'm not a producer. I do write and I do sing, but I don't have anything to show. And I know I'm a good singer, but it's like, I'm scared to like be like, hey, do you want to get in a session with me or anything like that? So, you know, lately I, I've been just like reaching out to artists and I'm like, I love your music. Can we get coffee sometime? And, you know, I'll show them like a demo of a song. And next thing you know, they're like, oh my God, like, let's like work together. And I actually have a session next week with an artist that uh, is represented by an amazing um, team and, and she's extremely talented and she's excited to work on my project. So I think it, it's just about being a friend and, and, and being, you know, looking to also see where you can help other people too within the industry, because a lot of artists who like, you know, actors are, they want to know how to do social media. So, you know, exchange that, you know, those traits and, and, uh, you know, work together. Well, I know some people's, you know, DMs are going to be blowing up tomorrow or probably even tonight. Right. Yes. So, 
Um, Michael, do we have any other, la well, we had a couple of resources, but I am aware of the time and yay, I'm glad you have the link. Yeah, ready. you can take a screenshot of this um, mm -hmm. if you're interested, because for those, I mean, we talked a lot about TikTok in case you are not on TikTok, get on TikTok, you know, and you'll see what we're talking about. There is the support of TikTok and thanks to Ariel, we have the um, BlueMXO um, site. I'm um, also the example we put into the chat, you know, with the Forever Purge, which I think is a really great marketing example of how the studio and content worked with, with influencers, you know, to be able to help cross promote. And then obviously, obviously follow Josh, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> And then I think, um, the, I, Jen, do you want, you know? Ah, let me take it from here. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sad to say this is about almost the end of the panel. Don't log off yet because we got a special quasi surprise. You know what it is if you've been to our panels before. So obviously Writers Guild Foundation, Enid and Kat. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wow. Our home, you know, while we're at home. So uh, we couldn't do it without you guys. Ladies and gentlemen, dun, 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 final draft. Yes, that's right. If you take our survey to tell us hopefully how fabulously we did, uh, that link is going into the chat momentarily. Uh, thank you, Michael. So, hey, look at that. We have four downloads to give away, but you have to fill in the survey, you know. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, that is what we are doing there. And everybody, yes, follow us. Hello, here we are. Look at that. We need to get our own TikTok channel. We're gonna have uh, Michael, we're gonna have to edit, you know, three minute videos. Uh, I'll, let, I'll let you be the stuff. celebrity on that one, Jen. I'll yeah, you, yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. We will be soon. Of course, our website, businessofcreating.org. Please, if you are not already on our mailing list, please get on our mailing list. 2022 is gonna be amazing. So, Ariel, Michael, Josh, Writers Guild. Thank you. Thank you. This is as close as I get to speechless with all this information. My brain is so beyond full. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I cannot you, wait to Jen. collaborate with you guys in the near future. Yes. And thank you for moderating, Jen. Loved it. <laughs> so. oh, oh, I learned the most. I, I'm just, I'm so glad we record these so I can watch them again as well and write down all the notes now. Okay. <laughs> thank you for having us. It's such an honor. Thank it was, you. It was great to see Ariel and great to meet you, Josh. Yeah. Great for all of you had an amazing time and hopefully you know we're able to give some good info and i learned a lot too so awesome that's all that's what we're all about all right thank Bye, you everyone. everybody take care Bye -bye. happy holidays yes. happy holidays happy holidays